You want running back rankings? We have you covered. Let's break down our entire top 24 running back rankings tier list, starting with the first round. Yeah, in the first round, we do have three names up top there with Christian McCaffrey, Brees Hall, Bijan Robinson. All three guys, legendary upside. Let's hear the bull and bear cases for them. Yeah, with each one of these guys, we'll go through kind of the pros and cons and then their positional outlooks as well as kind of what wide receivers we would take them around. So with Christian McCaffrey, the pros are very simple. He's extremely talented. He has elite receiving upside. He's been a legendary running back multiple times, probably one of the best fantasy football running backs in NFL history. He's in the best offense in the NFL. He has full autonomy in the red zone on the goal line. He is basically good for a touchdown per game. The only cons you have with Christian McCaffrey is the fact that he's a little bit older, has a lot of touches under his belt. We've talked about this for a number of years now, but the risk is worth the reward given what Christian McCaffrey can provide for you should he stay healthy this year. Again, gut feeling, do I feel like he's one of the riskiest first round picks because of the age and the touch apex for sure, but I'm willing to take that risk. With Brees Hall, you have a lot of pros as well. Now with Aaron Rodgers coming in, a lot of offensive line improvements, Tyron Smith, Morgan Moses, they drafted Olu Fushano in the first round, and the fact that Brees Hall is now two years removed from the ACL tear. We saw this guy finish top six at the running back position once he took over a full workload last year. Having all of those better situational factors is only going to be better for him. The only real cons you could have for Brees Hall is maybe Braylon Allen, maybe Isaiah Davis work into his workload a little bit more. Maybe Aaron Rodgers is not quite the same quarterback we once saw, but we already saw this dude overcome a lot of factors. I actually didn't draft him yesterday in my home league, but I did trade for him about 20 minutes after the draft. So feel pretty good about Brees Hall this year. He is my fourth overall player and then Bijan Robinson you have the pros are very simple he's elite, an elite talent just like Brees Hall just like Christian McCaffrey we know he can affect the receiving game just like both of those guys as well and with Kirk Cousins coming in with Michael Penix coming in that's a big time upgrade to the quarterback play and also we don't have Arthur Smith there anymore to not use him in the red zone the only big concern you have with Bijan Robinson is the fact that Tyler Algier is still present in that backfield how big of a part of the offense is he going to be? And how is Zach Robinson and this new offense going to gel with Kirk Cousins coming off an Achilles tear? So all three of these guys worthy of top five picks, top six picks in your fantasy football drafts. Yeah, they are all currently ranked inside of my top five, having Christian McCaffrey at two, Brees Hall at four, Bijan Robinson at five. Like you kind of said, if you're a more risk averse drafter, you want to trust the young upside of a Brees, of a Bijan over a Christian McCaffrey, I'm not going to fault you for it. Again, from a pure projection standpoint, given his receiving role, given his overall dominance in terms of inside the five, inside the 10 attempts on that San Francisco offense, I do have Christian McCaffrey ranked as my RB1. But in terms of Brees Hall, like you said, the bull case is pretty simple. Even if he loses some touches out of the backfield to a guy like Braylon Allen, he could very well be the wide receiver too on this Jets team. We're talking about a running back that was actually leading the NFL in terms of PFF receiving grade. We've already saw it all offseason, them getting him out of the backfield, catching touchdowns in some offseason training. So it's really exciting to see just how good this offense can be. One goal line carry across the entirety of the year. With Aaron Rodgers coming back, I do think we see a lot more offensive stability. And then, like you say, with B. John Robinson, it's almost like taking the monkey off of his back. That's what Arthur Smith was last year for him, hamstringing his decisions, hamstringing his overall usage. We do see the best running back prospect we have ever personally scouted entering year two with a much improved offensive situation, quarterback upgrade, OC upgrade. I think all three of these guys can legitimately hit 25 plus points per game. Yeah, absolutely. I feel very good about all three of them. Like I said, I traded for Brees Hall shortly after my draft was over, and I feel Drafted very good. Drafted him in the flock league. Anchoring. Exactly. And a half point for first down bonus league, like you guys have seen in my best draft strategy video, I did break down the strategy there. Let's move on to the guys that we would kind of take more so in the one-two turn. And again, we, we do have the names of the tiers listed as where we would draft them in a fantasy draft. So at the one-two turn, you're talking Jameer Gibbs, Saquon Barkley, Jonathan Taylor, and Devon A. Chan. Those latter two, Jonathan Taylor, A. Chan, and even Barkley as well, I would definitely prefer, prefer to get into the early to mid-second round. Jameer Gibbs, yeah. I would be okay taking at the 111, the 112. With Gibbs, you're looking at the pros being a very good pass-catching running back, very good offense. Detroit Lions projected for a top three scoring offense offense per Vegas right now. Jameer Gibbs, very, very good prospect, came in 12th overall pick in the NFL draft, finishes a top 10 running back in his rookie season. Yes, David Montgomery is there, and that is the only real major con for Jameer Gibbs, but Jared Goff is going to throw a lot to his running backs. He's an immobile quarterback. David Montgomery, as we know, could be set for a bit of a regression uh, touchdown-wise because Jameer Gibbs is an extremely young running back. Year one to two is when we see these big jumps from fantasy football running backs, so I am not as worried about Jameer Gibbs. With 
Saquon Barkley, the pros are pretty simple. He's been a multi-time RB1 finisher. We know he has the talent to carry a big workload. We know he has the size, the speed, the athleticism, and the receiving chops to impact every area of the field. The big cons that people have for Saquon, in my opinion, are very narrative-driven. People look at Saquon Barkley going to the Eagles, and they think, oh, is Jalen Hurts going to do the tush push on the goal line, and Saquon's not going to get nearly as much rushing uh, touchdown upside as we usually see from Saquon Barkley? But DeAndre Swift, one of the most inefficient running backs in the red zone the last couple of years, he was the guy that caused all of those tush-push touchdowns. Saquon Barkley doesn't get tackled on the one-yard line like DeAndre Swift did. And the other thing that people might be thinking is that this offense has a lot of mouths to feed. Again, I wouldn't worry about that. Saquon is going to be a huge beneficiary of a lot of talent on the outside. And Jalen Hurts potentially won't throw him the ball. But guess what? He played with Daniel Jones the last couple of years. Daniel Jones is a mobile quarterback as well. And he was still able to be a top five running back in terms of overall targets anytime he was on the field. And then going over to Jonathan Taylor and Devon H. And starting off with Jonathan Taylor, you can make the case that this is the best offensive situation he has seen in his career since that, you know, breakout RB1 overall finish. Shane Steichen, obviously, Anthony Richardson being able to push the envelope at the quarterback position. This Colts offense is viewed as one of the potential breakout offenses in the NFL this year. And the last time we saw a Shane Steichen quarterback in a potential breakout situation, he just so happened to finish as the quarterback one in fantasy there with Jalen Hurts. So I get it. It's risky, especially if you're a Colts fan. And watching the preseason games, you know, he throws a pick six. People really are pessimistic about Anthony Richardson at this current point. I don't think you should be. Again, this is still a six foot four, 245 pound mobile quarterback. And even if he's not the best pocket pass in the NFL right away, what he's able to do with his rushing, what he's able to do, especially inside the five, inside the 10, design quarterback power, design quarterback work, which is what we saw in spurts last year in the four games that he was healthy starting last season. And like Jalen Hurts, if Anthony Richardson is to break out to that level, Jonathan Taylor is going to have open run lane. Jonathan Taylor running behind a good offensive line, the touchdown equity he should have in this offense. If the Colts offense does end up being a top 10 to 12 unit, Jonathan Taylor may very well walk into 16 to 18 rushing touchdowns. And then with Devon HN, I mean, it's basically the similar case to Jameer Gibbs. High value offense, elite offensive play caller there with Ben Johnson. Obviously, with the Miami Dolphins, we got Mike McDaniel over there. And the only real concern of Devon Achan would be people quoting his size in the 180 pounds. But by all accounts, it does sound like he's added size this offseason. Mike McDaniel has actually said himself that they want to get more on the plate of Devon Achan going into year two. And I mean, this is our philosophy. Anytime a rookie running back shows Alvin Kamara level efficiency in his rookie season, we want him on our teams. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Because with Devon Achan and Jameer Gibbs, when you finish as a top 10 running back your rookie season on a limited workload, on a split backfield, you are definitely more likely than not to get a workload increase. And I get those guys are undersized dudes, but the offensive coordinators that we trust, Ben Johnson, Mike McDaniel, even if they're not getting 25 carries a game like Jonathan Taylor would or like some of these other guys would, the high value touches is what we want with these guys. Devon Achan can catch upwards of four, five, six passes a game. He can run long touchdowns in like we saw from him last year. He can get designed rushing lanes. One carry in a Mike McDaniel offense with Devon Achan is so much more valuable than like five Zamir White carries. Yeah, and what's hilarious about this here is if you kind of like 2v2 compared each set of guys, Jameer Gibbs, Devon Achan, similar cases. Again, we would prefer Gibbs uh, for the most part, but if you told me Devon Achan and Jameer Gibbs legitimately had the same upside path, I would agree with that. And with Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor, they also profile similarly in the sense that they're more bell cow style backs, should get more overall workload and potential touchdown equity in good offenses. Not to mention they have the same major concern too, is that both guys have Shane Steichen imprints on their offense, yeah. as well as the fact that their quarterback might snipe them on the goal line. So again, all of those narratives to say, I would feel very comfortable drafting these players. And if those Great. narratives don't come true, all of these guys could absolutely crush, have a 20 point per game type of season. Let's move into the next tier of guys here with Isaiah Pacheco, Travis Etienne, and Kyron Williams. The pros and cons for each one of these guys is pretty simple, especially with Pacheco and Etienne. You have workhorse size. You have three down upside, especially with Pacheco. It sounds like he's worked a lot on his receiving work. He has no real backfield competition. Same with Etienne. He's got Tank Bigsby there and pretty much nothing else. Both of those guys, Pacheco and Etienne, finished his top 12 running backs in points per game last year. Pacheco is attached to the Kansas City Chiefs 
offense, Patrick Mahomes, and that offense is going to be firing on all cylinders, especially when you factor in the fact that they brought in Xavier Worthy, the fact that they brought in Hollywood Brown to go along with Travis Kelsey, to go along with Rasheed Rice. There is going to be very, very light boxes in Kansas City for Isaiah Pacheco. I think he could have a monster year. The biggest con you might have for Pacheco is that he's maybe not the best running back in the NFL, but he's a talented enough guy in a great offense, in a great situation, running behind one of the best offensive lines in the NFL, playing with the best quarterback in the world, that it might not matter if he is, let's say, the 17th best running back talent in the NFL. And then with ETN. Which, that might even be cautious projection, to be honest, because anytime you see a young running back this efficient, like it, mo it more so feels like we're holding it back a little bit until he has that breakout season. And then everybody's going to be ranking him as a top five to 10 guy. If he goes out this year, has a 1200 yard, 1300 yard, 15 touchdown type of season. And people might be hearing that like, oh, that sounds outrageous. And this offense, they could legitimately not only lead the league in scoring, but potentially be a 31, 32, 33 point per game offense, which we have seen historically at the running back position tend to be very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And then with ETN, the major pros that you have for him is that he was a first round pick. He's a really talented back. He obviously wasn't great down the stretch last year. His efficiency dropped off. The whole offense in Jacksonville kind of dropped off there. But I, as a sophomore running back after not playing his rookie season at all, Travis Etienne averaged five yards per carry. He has a chance to get back to that old school efficiency that he had in his second year. And not to mention, he is a great receiving back as well. He was a top five running back in terms of overall target share. He has the upside to be an elite running back, just like he was the first eight games of the year. He was averaging over 20 fantasy points per game. And, Tank Bigsby is his only backfield competition. Now, it sounds like they're going to want to get him involved a little bit, but he's do he doesn't worry me. He's not the type of running back that I think could take a huge, huge workload off of Travis Etienne's plate. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that because actually I did cover that in the Truth Series. 20.5 PPR points per game and a guy that was basically scoring almost 0 0.9 rushing touchdowns per game. And if you actually combine his total touchdowns, was averaging a touchdown per game. So if we do see this Jaguars offense get back to that level that we projected going into last season, we do see ETN get a sizable step up. And it's kind of funny because with ETN going into last year, we were quoting his efficiency and to see what the volume would look like going into that next season. It almost feels like the inverse this year where people automatically think he's not an efficient player because he had one down year in what was ultimately one of the most disastrous situations on the stretch. Jaguars offensive line issues. Trevor Lawrence also getting hurt. Obviously, Christian Kirk dealing with that injury at the end of the season. If the Jaguars offense is fully healthy and by all accounts, the addition to Brian Thomas could very well also stretch the defense vertically, create some lanes between the tackles. People are sleeping on the potential efficiency upside we could see from ETN, potentially in a bounce back. Yeah, I mean, you said a down year. He was RB7 in points per game last year. He literally was going, he, he finished yeah. higher than where he's currently going right now. And, and like you said, with Pacheco and ETN, they both added a lot of speed to their offense to help stretch the field and open up the box for those two running backs. Now we pivot into Kyron Williams of the Los Angeles Rams. The pros for him are very simple. I mean, he was a 20 point per game scorer last year. So we yeah. know he's talented enough. We know he has a big enough workload under his belt, at least in previous seasons. And we know he's efficient. I mean, he was a top five running back in rush yards over expected last year. He's a very good receiving back as well. He was really good on the goal line. Everything you wanted to see from Kyron Williams in 2023, you saw. The only issue and the reason that he's ranked here instead of probably in the one-two turn tier where he probably would have been had the team not drafted Blake Corum is the fact that he now has a backfield mate who is a third round pick, who is a good prospect, especially in the red zone, scored like 27 rushing touchdowns uh, last year for the Michigan Wolverines national champion. Uh, shout out to Danny here. But with Kyron Williams, he is the type of guy that even on a, let's say, 70% workload relative to the like 95% opportunity share that he had last year, he can still be a mid RB one. I just don't quite think he has the upside that Pacheco does that ETN does, because I think that quorum will take away some of those high value touches on the yeah. goal line, potentially in the receiving game as well. Whereas Pacheco and ETN, I'm less worried about their backfield competition. I think all three of these offenses, I really believe in, I think Jacksonville bounce back. I think the Rams will be really good. And of course the Kansas city chiefs will be really good. I just think that Kyron might have the worst workload of these three running backs, which is why I have him yeah. ranked the lowest of these guys, but they're all in the same tier. If you think his workload is going to be closer to last year's, I wouldn't really fight you on it. I just think Corum is a major addition to this backfield. Yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned that because people will point to Kyron last year, like, oh, he was such a workload dependent guy. But we actually also saw him be able to suffice when all the Rams weapons were actually healthy. In that eight game sample size, we saw a player that was averaging 21.7 PPR points per game. But the main takeaway is that he was very efficient on his carries down that stretch. And we're still talking about a guy that will have high touch on equity. We saw last year, despite missing five games, he was legitimately one of the top end running backs in terms of goal line usage. 50 inside the 20 carries were attached to Sean McVay and his 
historically, as we know, that Sean McVay Ram scheme tends to favor a bell cow running back inside the five, inside the 10. Yeah, again, we just need to see what, what quorum is going to look like in this backfield. Sure. And unfortunately, we don't get any preseason usage to determine how that will look, but we'll have to kind of be guessing going into our fantasy drafts. So round three to four, again, these guys we probably wouldn't be taking specifically until probably about mid round three to like the three, four turn. But I know a lot of these guys might go higher in your home league, specifically Derek Henry and Josh Jacobs, because yeah. they've been highly drafted running backs before. Hilarious and, beside each other, by the way. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're very close to each other in our rankings, but at the same time, we do have a number of wide receivers that we would rather take over them. We do have a couple, you know, tight ends and quarterbacks and guys like that, that we would take over these guys. So this like, uh, Kyron and up tier are really the hero double hero kind of anchors that we're looking for early in our drafts. And then these cook Henry and Jacobs guys are more like if they fall to us, we'll take them. So with James cook, the pros are pretty simple. He plays for the Buffalo bills. They lost Stefan Diggs. They lost Gabriel Davis. They're going to be looking for a guy to step up in this offense. And James cook was really good down the stretch last year. Once Joe Brady took over four of the six touchdowns, he scored last year with Joe Brady. Once he took over James cook has the ability apparently to add size this year, just like Devon H and they've already talked about it. And with James cook in all the preseason games so far, he has been on the field for every single snap. So I get that they drafted Ray Davis and similar to Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor. He has a quarterback that can snipe him inside the red zone. We don't actually know if he's going to get all that work yet, but if he does, he has a really, really high ceiling because he's a, a three down workhorse back profile because of the the receiving upside and because of the fact that he never leaves the field and this offense absolutely needs somebody to step up so James Cook makes a ton of sense to be the engine of this offense go along with Josh Allen not a lot of targets in the passing game he could legitimately have 90 plus targets this year if he had the same touch on equity that Devon H and Jameer Gibbs did he could very well be a second round caliber player the main question people have is Quite frankly, is Josh Allen going to snipe another 15 rushing touchdowns? Ray Davis being brought in this offseason between the tackles grinders. Is he going to take some of that work? At the end of the day, when I have a running back insulated and put, could potentially be a top 10 offense with a quarterback like Josh Allen, with the receiving skill set that James Cook has, again, a guy that averaged over 10 yards per target last year, I mean, it's basically foolproof. All you need is for him to actually be a factor inside the five, inside the 10. And not only are you looking at a pick that will eventually pay off, but he could quite frankly win leagues at that spot. So it's funny because James Cook, to me, is the clear upside shot of this round three, four tier. And I mean, Derek Henry and Josh Jacobs are two peas in a pod. And I got roasted on a TikTok for saying I prefer Jacobs. But to me, it's basically the bet on Henry, except you're doing it with a much younger player. And what could even be a better offense? Yeah, with both guys, I feel like the pros are very simple. It's Derrick Henry and the Ravens. He's going to score a lot of touchdowns. That's where the, the upside comes from. He has a chance to punch in 15 touchdowns this year in an offense where Lamar Jackson is going to draw defenders out of the box and things of that nature. Derrick Henry wasn't efficient last year, but he also played for a really bad team. Same can be said for Josh Jacobs. Wasn't efficient last year, played for a really bad team, and he goes to a much better situation where the Green Bay Packers have weapons upon weapons. Uh, they have guys on the outside that can stretch the field. They have guys in the box that can... Uh, I do work over the middle of the field. All I know about both of these guys is they have a chance to post, you know, nice little spikes up in efficiency relative to what they did last year. The only thing I'm worried about specifically with Henry is that Baltimore lost a lot of pieces on their offensive line. That's one con I have for him. He is 30 years old and has the most touches of any non Ezekiel Elliott running back in the NFL right now. And also too, Derrick Henry, as we know, is not going to be a factor in the receiving game, especially with Lamar Jackson as his quarterback. And then with Josh Jacobs, his major con is Matt LaFleur likes to deploy a committee. How involved is Marshawn Lloyd? Does he take away third down work? How involved is AJ Dillon? Does he take away goal line work? We don't know exactly what the workload will be for Josh Jacobs yet. And he's also a little bit older, has a lot of touches stacking up on him as well. So with both of these guys, there's definitely more concerns that I'm willing to say, oh, let's put them all the way up in the two, three turn tier. Let's take them at 211, 212 because we need a running back. I think Derrick Henry and Jacobs are more likely to be guys that I let my league mates draft, but I don't think they're necessarily bad picks. I just, I, I have them a little bit lower than most people are willing to draft them. Yeah, he completely agrees with that. Again, I would take Jacobs over Henry. And the reason why as well is when you're talking about a tiebreaker, it's a very good tiebreaker to look at historical precedent. And this is actually data provided by Ryan Heath over at Fantasy Points. But your nine running backs, which is what Derrick Henry is going into this season, on average produce only 61.7% of their average career production. Again, I get it. When this guy was in his prime, one of the best peak running backs in our era, potentially in NFL history, but when you're looking at a data point of him potentially falling off by half the production that we've seen at his peak, it's really worrisome. Again, Derrick Henry, we know in his prime, great between the tackles runner, 
didn't have to do anything in the receiving game because he was giving you 16, 17, 18 touchdowns. But if he's getting less efficient between the tackles, less work overall on the ground, and he's not making up for it in the receiving game, that's where I get worried. And people are going to be in the comments and say, well, he's on the Baltimore Ravens offense. They're going to, you know, fall backwards into touchdowns. Well, Derrick Henry last season was still top three and inside the five carries. So I get it. He's going to have more touchdown upside working with the Ravens. But in terms of his overall work inside the five, you can't really go anywhere but down. Yeah, exactly. And I think with both of these guys too, I talked about, you know, how running backs can disappoint you. And obviously because they're older, they're very likely to get injured, but they also strike me as their hit means that they, you draft them RB 11 and they finished RB 39. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're not excited about where they, they finish. And both of these guys were silent killers last year. Both of them drafted inside the top 12. Both of them finished like 14 and 18 respectively in points per game. They're not the types of running backs that I like drafting early in my draft. Agreed. I like drafting guys that can return on their ADP. They can boom for a top five season, potentially have that 20 plus point per game upside that we're craving. And I think of this tier, James Cook is the one with that upside and Derrick Henry and Jacobs are more so like you put them in your lineup because you feel good about them and you feel good about their work. They're safe, and that's even though they're not. Exactly. And which safety doesn't exist at running back because of the injury rate exactly. of this position. 20% of the time you're getting an early round running back. They're going down for six or more games. The biggest misconception in fantasy is that I'm drafting this running back for the safe workload, but being able to project a workload year in and year out is just not a thing at the running back position. Because like you said, I mean, you talked about it all offseason when you're talking about the running back dead zone, the wide receiver hit rates in that area compared to the running back hit rates. Well, running backs get hurt more often and pay off less often. So when we're in this range, again, in home leagues, you may have to make a decision between like Derrick Henry and Nico Collins. Why would you ever take Derrick Henry in that spot? Yeah, especially in PPR formats and stuff. And Derrick Henry and Jacobs both in my home league yesterday went before like the 306. Like they were off yeah. the board like early in the third round. And that's pretty much what I expect in most home leagues. And if anything, I'd actually expect them to go a little bit higher in a lot of people's yeah. home leagues than that. So um, they're not guys that I typically draft, but they are top 13 running backs for me. And of course, if you guys do want all of our rankings, our running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, tight ends, overall rankings, our risk ratings, our truth series, all that stuff is in our draft guide. Hit the link down below in the description to get started over on Underdog Fantasy. You get it for free when you sign up using the promo code FSE and deposit 10 bucks. It will be in your email inbox within 24 hours. So let's move down beyond the top 13 running backs into kind of the running back dead zone archetypes here with Joe Mixon, Kenneth Walker, Rashad White, Alvin Kamara, and Ramondre Stevenson. These guys would, I guess, close out our top 18 running backs. With yeah. Joe Mixon, Kenneth Walker, Rashad White, Kamara, and Stevenson, you're looking at all five of these profiles being, okay, they have some upside. The pros for Mixon, for example, is that he could punch in a lot of touchdowns on the Texans offense. He's been a productive fantasy running back. Kenneth Walker has been talked up about potentially expanding his receiving workload, and we know what he can do from a big play standpoint. We know what he can do on the goal line. So he has a decent outlook. Rashad White, top five, 10 running back last year in points per game. You look at the fact that he has a great workload. So he has a, a, the upside and he's a third year running back too. He could still get better. Alvin Kamara was the third best running back in fantasy on a points per game basis last year because he led pretty much all running backs and targets per game once he got back on the field. And then with Ramondre Stevenson just two years ago, he was a very good top 12 running back. And now he gets a quarterback upgrade with Drake May. So the pros for all of these guys are definitely there. I can see why people like them. But the cons are the reason that we have them ranked down here. And the cons are the reason that we're taking wide receivers in the dead zone, the quarterbacks in the dead zone, tight ends in the dead zone. Because with Mixon and with Kamara specifically, you have older running backs, a lot of touches under their belt. They don't quite look like the same players they once were. With Kenneth Walker, we do worry about Zach Charbonnet in the backfield competition there. With Rashad White, we worry about Bucky Irving in the backfield competition, as well as his own ability. And then that's also kind of true for Kenneth Walker as well. And then with Ramondre Stevenson, how good is this Patriots offense going to be? Yeah, and I'll just get into Kamara specifically first. I have significant concerns about this offensive insulation with the New Orleans Saints. And we saw Alvin Kamara last year, 29-year-old running back, cited the data, data for Derrick Henry of year nine running backs, only 62% of their average career production. Well, in that Ryan Heath chart, we do see year eight running backs, only 73.1% of their average career production. And in terms of last season, we did see significant decline in terms of his efficiency, 3.86 yards per carry, 5.42 yards per target. Like in his prime, Alvin Kamara may very, very well have been one of the best receiving running backs I have ever seen in my life. But even if he's getting receiving work this year, he's not a good receiving back anymore. 
Yeah, no, I, with all these guys, you can poke holes in their cases, which is why they're dead zone running backs. And there's a point in time, like I have these guys ranked, Joe Mixon is my highest ranked of this group. I have him ranked 57th Walker overall. Walker for so me. If you're, if you're doing the math there, we're talking like early in the sixth round, late in the fifth round, I would start to consider Joe Mixon yeah. if he was falling. The problem with all of these running backs, and the lowest one is Stevenson for me at 70th overall, is yeah. that most of these guys will go instead of round six, seven, where we have them ranked, they're going to go in round four, round five in most of your homely drafts. Like I had my homely draft yesterday. Alvin Kamara was the only one of these guys really that slipped. And same with uh, Stevenson. Rashad White went in the fourth round. Kenneth Walker went in the fourth round. And Joe Mixon ended up going, I believe, in the fifth round. So if you're looking at exactly which one of these running backs to take, my answer would be if one of them slides to you in like the sixth round and you kind of want to deviate into the dead zone for them at that point, there are pros to these guys. They're not total dead zone, Alexander Madison, Miles Sanders of last year. They definitely do have upside cases, but I'm worried about each of them individually for one reason or the or another, as I talked about already. Yeah, in terms of where I have them ranked, Kenneth Walker would be my highest there, but Joe Mixon and Rashad White thereafter. Uh, Kenneth Walker at 58, Mixon at 59, Rashad White at 60, respectively. Ramondre Stevenson I do have ranked at 71, and then Alvin Kamara I do have down at 78. So all that goes to show, I mean, I understand. I just said I would not draft Alvin Kamara. That's more so when Alvin Kamara is going in the top four rounds, top five rounds of your home leagues. Like if he does slip, you're in a sharper league. He's there in round seven, and you want to get early season production. I'm not going to fight you for it at the end of the day. Again, I don't think he has the upside to win you your league, and I wouldn't be drafting him where he's currently going in most markets. But if he does slip, like Corey said, again, we're still playing a value game, especially early season projection for a lot of these guys because, quite frankly, a lot of these guys, that's the quarter they meet is their early season projection. Yeah, and he went at the 6.07 in my home league yesterday, which to me I thought was a fine – uh, yeah, time to take him, especially in a league with running back premiums like my home league is. I think that was totally fine. So, and then closing out our top 24 running backs I had to move us a little bit because we were covering some of these names. Javante Williams, DeAndre Swift, Chase Brown, Jonathan Brooks, Aaron Jones, David Montgomery, and James Connor here. With all of these guys, Montgomery with Connor, with um Javante Williams, with DeAndre Swift, you're looking for, you know, high carry upside. You're looking for red zone equity. With Chase Brown, he's kind of the breakout candidate. Obviously, we want him to take the next step. He's a great athlete. He's in a great offense. We absolutely love Chase Brown around here. I literally drafted him yesterday Same. in the ninth round of my home league draft. And I also drafted Jonathan Brooks in the eighth round because I have an IR spot in my league. And if you guys have IR spots in your league, you have the Take potential that once Jonathan Brooks comes back, he gets the Rashad White treatment from Dave Canales. He gets all of the work. He gets all of the receiving work. And then with Aaron Jones, you're also thinking, yes, the offense might not be very good. It might not be great with Sam Darnold there, but he has a chance to have a pretty nice workload. He's been efficient when he's been on the field. Health and injury concerns are kind of his major, his major bugaboo right now. Yeah, and uh, it's funny you mentioned, uh, we actually both ended up with Chase Brown. So if you guys will end up eventually watching that vlog with the Flock League, did end up getting my boy Chase Brown. You got him obviously in your home league. I mean, it just kind of makes sense that the two Canadians end up taking the Canadian running back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, with, with all these guys, like, I mean, all of them have their pros and cons. Like we said, the reason I like drafting this group of running backs a little bit better than the round five to six group of running backs is because of the wide receivers I'm passing on in round five to six versus the guys that I'm passing on or potentially passing on in this yep. area of the draft. I was okay drafting Jonathan Brooks in the eighth round. I was okay drafting Chase Brown in the ninth round because I'm not passing on T Higgins. I'm not passing on Rasheed Rice. I'm not passing on Lad McConkey. I'm not passing on even if you guys like other receivers or quarterbacks too, like the quarterbacks that you're passing on to go after these Joe Mixon, Kenneth Walker, Rashad White types, the tight ends that you're passing on, Kincaid, Pitts, Kittle, those type of guys. That's where those players go, which is why I'm not often ending up with Mixon, with Walker, with White, with Kamara or Stevenson very often. And I think that's the biggest misconception of the dead zone. It's not called the dead zone because we think none of these guys can pay off. Like, obviously, there are cases every year of running backs paying off in the dead zone. It's called the dead zone because of the opportunity cost. You have to take them over wide receivers, quarterbacks, tight ends in that range. Because like you said, when you're in the round five, round six area, you got basically the entire tier two of tight ends like Dalton Kincaid, Kyle Pitts, Mark Andrews, Trey McBride, all of those names in that area, assuming Laporta and Kelsey go a little bit earlier. And then you also have the second tier, I would say, of quarterbacks. Like if you can get a falling Mahomes, you know, guys like CJ Stroud, Dak Prescott, Jordan Love, uh, Joe Burrow, all kind of going in that range uh, in your home leagues. And then in terms of the wide receiver position specifically, we're looking at legitimately 30, 40 names that have legitimate upside. And if you're in a half PPR full PPR or a, you know, two wide receiver, two flex, three wide receiver, two flex starting lineup type of league. 
filling out your wide receiver depth is a lot more important to me than grabbing a shaky running back profile when the distinction between some of the running back profiles and the round five, six area versus the round seven, eight aren't really that different. Yeah, I mean, you got Javante Williams versus Kenneth Walker. You got two kind of breakout candidate running backs. Of course, one's on a worse offense than Javante Williams, but I think Javante Williams has more three down upside than Kenneth Walker. So you can kind of weigh the pros and cons Chase Brown of too. each of these guys. And literally the hit rates tell you that it's actually better to bet on running backs in rounds seven to 10 than it is to bet on running backs in rounds four, five, and six. The bet zone running backs in rounds eight to 10 hit 44.64% of the time relative to wide receivers. It's only a 2% difference versus in the dead zone talking rounds four to seven of the running back position where 35.5% hit rate. So we actually hit at a higher rate later on because the opportunity cost is lower. So it's an easier hit. And then also too, the wide receivers are a 12% difference in that area of the board. So you are better mathematically taking a wide receiver profile in that area of the draft taking a couple wide receiver profiles in that area of the draft, then swinging on your running backs in the dead zone. And again, we covered it all in the running back bet zone versus dead zone video that there are a couple guys in the area that we actually don't mind. But for the most part, like you said, when you're trusting the data, that's why in the hero and double hero running back draft strategy videos, we basically said, like, if you want a chance at an elite RB1 level ceiling, you kind of have to draft one of those guys in the top three rounds. Like we're looking basically Kyra enough at that list. And potentially for us, because we love this guy, may even push James Cook as a hero as well. Yeah, exactly. So we talk about the strategy. We talk about how to actually execute these things. This is kind of the micro player take version of that. So which yeah. guys are you actually drafting when you're doing hero RB, when you're doing double hero RB? A lot of people commented on my number one draft strategy video that I talked all this crap about not taking running backs early. And then I drafted Devon Achan and Isaiah Pacheco in the two, three turn. Well, the reason I did that is because Devon Achan and Isaiah Pacheco are some of those very, very seldom, very limited running back profiles that I actually believe have elite upside. And that's what I said in that video. I said, if a running back has elite upside, then you should take them in the first round, in the second round, in the third round Especially of your draft. Home and then other than that, you smash wide receivers. You take your elite onesies if you can, and then you avoid the running back dead zone and then catch up at that position, come round eight, round nine into the running back bet zone, as we're calling it, which is that round eight to 10 area. Yeah, and specifically too, if you guys watch us go through uh, the strategies on Sleeper, Yahoo, and ESPN as well, if you saw those charts on those videos, the least red was at the top of your draft. The least opportunity cost is when I have to take Brees Hall, B. John Robinson over, you know, Jefferson, Chase, Amon, or St. Brown, because they are all elite projections. Once you get down the board and you have to take like Derrick Henry over Nico Collins, that's when it starts to sway the favor of wide receivers. So if you know running backs are going to go early in your league, I would rather differentiate and take a running back at the top, knowing that I have that elite anchor and be able to catch up a wide receiver later on versus having to, you know, bet on a guy in round four that I don't think has a top projection. Yeah, absolutely. And in those ESPN videos, we're seeing James Conner and Zamir White and stuff go in like the mid fifth round, early sixth round. Like that's yeah. those those platforms are going to push the running back position up the board. So again, obviously know your league scoring format. For me, like I said, I drafted Brees Hall or technically drafted Brees Hall yesterday because my league is a full PPR league. It's a half point first down bonus to running backs, big play bonuses as well. Brees Hall is perfect in a league format like that. So know your league settings, know which guys are good in standard and half PPR leagues. You want your touchdown scores in full PPR leagues. You want your receiving back things of that nature. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, this tier list. We are dropping the wide receiver version of this later today because I know since we've been back from Texas, a lot of you guys kind of missed out on this content. We were planning to drop it yeah. earlier in the week, a Wednesday on Thursday, Technical but I know issues. a lot of you guys are probably drafting tonight. A lot of you guys are probably drafting tomorrow. So we wanted to make sure we got this out ASAP for you. And again, if you are drafting... A ASAP, let's say you're watching this on Saturday and you draft tonight, you're going to want our draft guide. You are going to dominate your league mates. Use our draft ready cheat sheet. You can check off the players that go off the board. You can check off the players on your team, see which tier breaks are still available on the board for you. I've literally used the, the draft ready cheat sheet in both of the drafts that I've done so far. And you'll get all of our positional rankings, all of our risk ratings. That risk ratings video will be out tomorrow. A lot of you guys really liked that video. Yes. Uh, last year as well. If you want all of our draft guide and all of that stuff, link is down below in the pinned comment. Sign up on Underdog Fantasy, use promo code FSE, deposit $10 or more, and you'll get it in your inbox within 24 hours. Got a lot of questions from people making the deposit on Underdog Fantasy. It is emailed to you within 24 
24 hours after you make your first deposit. And it should be in your in inbox pretty quickly. It shouldn't take 24 hours, but within 24 hours is the parameters that they told me to tell you guys. It should be in your inbox ASAP. And if you already have an underdog account, head over to flockfantasy.com, use code FSE, and you can get access to our redraft rankings manifesto 3.0, our redraft draft guide over there as well. It is on the post section. I've also gotten a couple questions of where it is located as well. So if that interests you, check it out down below. Like this video if you got some value from it. Subscribe to the channel if you are new around here. Peace out.